Welcome to the second vignette on statistical experimental design. Now that you understand why we use designed experiments, I want to debunk some myths about experimenting. Unfortunately, you may have learned these myths in a university physics course and have come to believe they are true. Let's begin by naming the technique you will be learning about. It's not just experimental design, but statistical experimental design. Now, how did statistics get into the name? Not just because we'll use statistical analysis methods to separate the truth from fiction, but because since statistics takes a sample from a larger population to draw inference, we'll actually take a sample of observations arranged in a special way to gain understanding of the process under study. We are going to be efficient. Remember, get the required information at the least expenditure of resources. Let's go back to the myth you learned in school. The myth of the experiment called the one factor at a time approach. You were taught that you could not change more than one factor at a time, since if you did, you would not know which factor caused the change. So you would start with a base case where each factor, A, B, and C, are at their low or base condition. Now we begin change by putting A at its high level, or changed condition, while of course B and C stay at their original base settings. Then we change B to its high condition, while A and C stay at their low conditions the base case. And then finally we change C to its change condition, its plus condition, while A and B stay at their original case. Let's look at a different approach, which is called the two-level factorial. The word factorial means looking at factors, not the mathematical expression meaning, say, 5 exclamation point, to multiply 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. We begin this design for three factors with the base case, just like in the one factor at a time. Then we change the level of factor A. Not so far, nothing different from the one factor at a time as we change factor B. But what is this? We change A and B simultaneously. How can we tell which one caused the change? Okay, back to the usual single change we give C its high level. But there are more simultaneous changes. A and C together, B and C together, and of all things, all of them changed at the same time. According to your old physics course teacher, this was not a good experiment. And what's worse, look at all the runs. The trusty old one factor at a time needs only four runs, but the statistical approach requires eight runs. Statistics makes more work. But does it? Let's look at the analysis of these two approaches. In the one factor at a time, the analysis of what causes changes is simplicity in itself. All we need to do is take the difference between the responses at the change case and the responses at the base case. But notice, the base case gets used three times in this analysis. What if we had made a blunder in this run and got the wrong result? Of course, all the results would be tainted. A good way to prevent such an erroneous result is to repeat the running of the base case to get more stable answers. How many times? A chemistry teacher once told me to repeat three times and keep the two that agreed the most. The analysis for the statistical 2 to the k factorial is Goodness, it must be statistical. Look at all those add them up signs. We do the same thing for each factor. We add up the responses at the high level of the factor and divide by 4 to give the average response at that level and add up the responses at the low level of that factor and divide by 4 to give the average response at the low level. Take the difference and we have the average effect of the change between the high and low. But can we really do this? Look at factor C, since it's easier to observe what we are doing. 
Here is the layout of the design, again showing the four runs with C at its low level at the top, and the four runs at the high level of C at the bottom. Yes, we have four runs, but can we legitimately average them without confusing the effects of factor A and factor B? Look at the pattern of changes in the factors A and B while C is low and the pattern of changes in factors A and B while C is high. These changes in A and B are exactly the same. So whatever they are doing to the response is balanced out in our experiment for factor C. This is exactly why this design is named the balanced factorial experiment and all the factors in this type of design are balanced. So, back to factor C. We are really comparing the averages of four runs, something we could not do in the one factor at a time approach. But if you want to stick to the tried and true, here's what you would need to do to get the same number of runs in the averages. You would have to replicate the runs in the one factor at a time four times each. Here's a diagram which shows how each run would be repeated four times. The base case, four times. The change in A, four times. The change in B, four times. And the change in C, four times. Now, how many total runs do we have? Sixteen. The balanced factorial had only eight. Statistics makes less work. And the bigger the investigation, the more efficient the balanced factorial becomes. With three factors, the efficiency factor is two. With five factors, the efficiency factor is three. You work out the math. But, and this is very important, the balanced factorial is able to ferret out information unavailable in the one factor at a time. That information is on interactions. An interaction is defined as the result of the non-additivity of two or more factors on the response. Interactions play a pivotal role in complex systems and often are the causes of unexpected surprises. Surprises that occur long after the design has been finalized and shipped to the customer. These surprises are costly. You can avoid them and they're related heavy expenses by using proper experimentation. Let's see how a designed experiment produces information on interactions not provided by the one factor at a time design. We'll work with a simple two factor design. First, we plot the value of the response when factor A is low and factor B is low. Then we plot the A high while B is still low. We see a small change due to the level of the factor A. The final point from the one factor at a time is A low and B high. But what happens when both A and B are high? We don't know, since that point is not in the one factor at a time. The best we can do is assume the same relationship occurs due to A, but just offset a bit. This is an extrapolation, a dangerous practice. The balanced factorial design gives us the high, high point, and if we were to plot, as we see here, our extrapolation was way off from the truth. Is this important? In the field of photographic chemistry, the interaction between hydroquinone and elon is well known and shows the super additivity or the synergistic effect of these two developer agents. A combination of the two developers produces a reaction rate greater than either of them by themselves. Another way to look at the benefits of an interaction is in a situation where we have two materials. We want to see the robustness to moisture in the atmosphere. Material 1 shows little change due to humidity from desert dryness to jungle wetness. Material 2 shows a huge change over these humidity conditions. Material 1 is the better choice since humidity is a factor we have no control over 
when the product goes to the customer. So balanced factorial designs have built-in replication to give us more precision in our estimates of the effects we study. And even more importantly, these design configurations discover and quantify the interactions that are so important in our investigations. Knowledge of interactions is the make or break aspect of good experimentation. In our next vignette, we'll learn how to build these balanced factorial designs. See you then.